A superpower in space, how China plans to take a giant leap into exploration. And defying gravity closer to Earth, we'll explain how you skydive on the ground. I'm Martin Stanford. This is Insight. Welcome to Insight. Plans for rovers on Mars, manned missions to the moon, space laboratories and 30 rocket launches in a year. Not NASA, not Russia, not even space entrepreneur Elon Musk. Those are in fact the ambitions of China's space program. Currently one of only two countries on the planet with the ability to send its own astronauts into space, Beijing has plans to defy gravity in a big way. Chinese investment in space exploration is at an all-time high, and their ambition matches that of even the world's biggest space agencies. But for the world's second largest economy, China remains conservative in terms of spending. Their annual funding for space science is dwarfed by the budget of their rivals. Unlike other spacefaring nations, the Chinese space program focuses heavily on lunar exploration. In December of 2013, China landed its first craft on the moon. It was the first lunar landing of any kind since 1976. China will attempt a world first in 2018 when they send a rover to the dark side of the moon. But all of this will form the foundation of a manned mission and beyond that, plans for a colony. And in 2020, China will attempt to land a rover on Mars, a feat only successfully undertaken by NASA. The first module of the Chinese large modular space station is set to be in orbit by 2018. It's expected to become fully operational at the same time the International Space Station is decommissioned. Though the new station will only be approximately one-sixth as large as the ISS, it may mark the beginning of a new space race, one in which China is in pole position. Well, to discuss that further, I'm joined by the space journalist Sarah Crudus, and also with us is Professor Alan Smith. He's the director of the Mullard Space Science Laboratory at University College in London. Welcome to you both. Now, Sarah, we saw the Russians and the Americans decades ago having a sort of space race. It was almost as much about national pride as anything else. Is it national pride that's driving China's adventures? Well, absolutely. You've got to remember that during the first space race, during the Cold War, China was living under the Mao regime, and actually many people living in China probably weren't even aware that humans had landed on the moon. You fast forward 40, nearly 50 years scarily, and China is this emerging superpower, and, and China has huge ambitions to say, just as during the, the Cold War, during the space race, look, we can do a big thing well. And that big thing, as 40, 50 years ago, is still space. So China has ambitions um, not only for low Earth orbit, they've already got their own astronauts or Taikonauts, which they're able to send into space, but to um, send human beings, so to send a crewed mission to the surface of the moon. And eventually, they are looking at Mars, possibly by the end of the 2020s. Of course, in space flight, as we've seen often, those dates often get pushed back. But China has huge ambitions, and the mentality in China is they go for things. Um, so it's a country which has changed a huge amount over the past few decades and it's really looking towards space. So ambition is one thing, Professor, but actually having the cash to do it is another. Is it state funding that's um, chipping in here or is it a mixture of private money as well? It's, it's fundamentally state funding, but there's, there's clear indications that they're seeking alternative funding routes. I mean, they're, they're putting in... Um, a, a fifth or something of what, uh, less than that, of what the US is putting in, for instance, a, a, a level which is so still quite with modest Russia. adventures. It's at the moment, relatively isn't it? modest, but very high ambitions. Um, the labour rates are a bit less, so they can do quite a lot more for the money. But nevertheless, um, it, it's, uh, it's working from a from a low financial base, effectively. And they already have not an international space station, because there's nothing international about it, is it? It's a Chinese space station, albeit quite a small one. Yeah, that's correct. But I think what you might see, actually, is this, what's brilliant about space is you think about immediately after the Cold War, immediately after Americans landed on the moon, within the next few years, you saw Russia and America collaborating in space. Even today, with the um, US-Russian uh, relations as they are, you've still got that collaboration in terms of space science. So I think longer term, 
if we're looking positively, it would be nice to think that actually China would collaborate with the rest of the world going forward, whether America would do that or not, whether a Chinese crew landing on the moon might spur America uh, to get back into that space race. But you've also got to look um, at the commercial aspects. So we're, living, we're never going to see another Apollo. That has gone. What we're living in now is a new commercial space race. And if you compare it to American history, Apollo was the Columbus moment. We're now in the Mayflower moment in terms of exploration. And China, um, although there is a lot of um, government funding, there's also a rise of the commercial the private sector in, in space in China. So you've got small companies trying to disrupt the industry, as we're seeing across Europe and really across the rest of the world as well. So yes, at the moment, China are doing things on their own, but it would not surprise me if, just as with the Russians and Americans, we do see collaboration going forward, because to get to Mars is not an easy feat. There's a reason why we haven't been there yet, and it will require a mix of private and government international collaborations to likely enable us to achieve that. Um, Alan, as we speak, they've got um, a cargo vessel, unmanned, I believe it's going to be, on the launch pad, and we'll see how that gets on as it's okay. due to blast off pretty soon. But is there any compatibility from what Sarah was saying? I mean, um, let me give you the fictitious scenario. If the ISS got into any trouble, could any kind of Chinese vehicle dock there successfully or help well, out? Um, it probably could, yes. I mean, the the... The Chinese have used a lot of Russian technology in their basic right. planning, and the Russian technology is compatible with the space station. So, that the, so the dimensions the basic match standards, today. Yeah, they're going to be the same standards <laughs> they're going to be using. And so right. it would be, and of course, the astronauts can put on um, um, their spacesuits and, and walk across, so to speak. So Indeed. that's true. And uh, just picking up on that last point, I mean, China has declared its intention to make its space station an international um, endeavour, and its, in its relations, it, for instance, with the European Space Agency, are becoming very strong now. And uh, there's collaborative missions. There's already been one collaborative mission with the space agency, Double Star, we were part of. There's Smile is another one that's uh, coming up in the near future. So I, it, they do see themselves as absolutely an international player. And I think they want to rival the US a little bit in being sort of open for business in space. But sort of in a sort of leadership role and inviting others to collaborate yes. with them rather than saying, me too, and let's join in. Yes. Tell me about the importance they see in the lunar adventure. I mean, why go back to the moon? There's so many reasons to go back to the moon. I mean, why explore space? Why do anything if you ask yeah. that question? So but the moon... How useful for is example, things um, you learn on the moon? Resources on the moon. So you could mine the moon. You've got uh, water on the moon, um, hydrogen, oxygen, which makes up water, also makes up the basic ingredients for rocket fuel. And at the moment, to launch into space, the further you want to go, um, the more fuel you need, the more fuel you need, the more uh, fuel you need to take off. It, so the moon as a service station, like yeah, on a motorway, is a, a real prospect quite yeah, soon. Yes, so it's expensive to go further into space, but you've got the resources on the moon to enable us to go just to the moon and then fill up and go further into space. And it sounds like science fiction, but um, when Kennedy said back in 61 that he wanted to send humans to the moon. That sounded like science fiction. We really are mm. pushing the envelope in terms of technology. So there's so many reasons. Also, as a stepping stone to get to Mars or perhaps an asteroid, um, it's probably more likely that we will return to the moon before going further into our solar system. So we're enabling humans to test all that technology if we go to the moon. And the moon is our nearest celestial um, neighbour. There's so much we can learn just by understanding the science and the geology um, about our own planet and about um, how our moon came to be as well. So there's a lot we can get from the moon in terms of science, in terms of resources, in terms of pushing the envelope. And you've got to remember, we went into, ex into space not just to explore space, but to improve life on Earth. And the technology, which comes from going to the moon, from having a long-term base on the moon, will benefit life back here on Earth. So there's a huge number of reasons. The question is, why would you not go back to the moon when it's there? Right. And, Professor, are there similar arguments presented for going to Mars? I mean, that is a whole new thing. They've got well, Elon Musk to have the race with, haven't they? Because he, he wants to get there as a private yeah, American individual. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think you should underestimate the, the um, uh, prestige nature. And going to the moon is catching up with Russia as it was 40, 50 years ago, and the US, of course, with the Apollo program. But where they are at the moment, um, Russia was in that position in, 1970, in 1974, less earlier than that. So they've got a lot of catching up to do. They will do some very interesting stuff on the moon, and they go to the far side of the moon. No one's ever been there before. But uh, Mars is, a, is new territory. Uh, sample return from Mars is the, is the sort of standard thing, the, the, the most exciting thing in planetary space science at the moment, getting a bit of Mars back to the Earth. If, if China can do that first, that would be an extraordinary uh, step forward. And although this is exciting on the level of um, let's push the bounds of human capabilities and let's push the science, 
there's a military component to this as well, isn't there? Well, because I, it would be naive to suggest they don't want to, if, if America can put some kind of defence around the globe, if Russia can do some of suit, China wants to say me too. Well, that's the same with the first base race as well. It was all based on, on military and there's certainly conversations um, within militaries, within Air Force globally, uh, and you'd be naive to think that there wouldn't be a military aspect because um, one country doesn't want the other country to be ahead of them in terms of uh, military technology. So yes, there is. But I think with space, it's largely been positive stuff, which has come out of space. And yeah. it does. And just to, you know, from the um, planetary science point of view, um, as you were just mentioning, the sample return, that's great in terms of science and improving our understanding of the solar system. And many people would say, send robots, you know, ahead of humans because we can gain more with the science. But in terms of human boots back on the moon and back on Mars. It doesn't matter what nation it is. That is going to reignite the same kind of inspiration and invigoration for science that we saw back in the 60s and early 70s. And you can't put a monetary value on that. So yes, there is a military aspect, but let's focus on the positives and we're becoming a space-faring space okay. species. Let, let's pretend this is a demilitarized zone. In the world of academia, is there a lot of shared thought and shared expertise or in a sense, are the Chinese having to learn all that the Americans and Russians have put together over the past few decades um, all over again? Not really. I mean, the Western has a, a very open view about its... its, its um, it, it, in it terms shares of the knowledge, science, does it? It shares knowledge in a very, very, very open way, and, and, and people can use other people's satellites and all sorts of things like that. The technology, not so much, but still, I mean, the US technology is very, very difficult uh, for China to get access to, we know that. But uh, well, I only ask because they're quite good at sort of getting hold of ideas and then building yeah, something yeah, yeah. similar cheaper. Well, that, that's the <laughs> that's the problem with with uh, U.S. rules. All the, the one of the things the U.S. rules is uh, of limiting technology into China has been is it's encouraged China and its sa satellite nations to develop their own technologies, and they are now becoming compatible and com uh, and com in competition with the yes. U.S. technologies. Yeah. So there is you know, there's, there's a, a balancing that goes on. But I mean, in the, on the in the sense of the defence sector, I mean, the, the, we, in, nowadays space isn't really differentiated defence versus non-defence. There's no weapons in space of that sort. The, people talk about dual use, but Earth observation satellites can look at crops in a field or troop movements. Um, yeah. So we have, uh, we have what's called Space 4.0, which is a, a space sector which serves everybody, including defence. I must remember that. Space 4.0. Yeah. But that's only the European term. It's space 2.0 in America. So it's, it's <laughs> oh, no, that's jargon. confusing. It's all <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Grannis and Alan Smith, thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. This is Inside. Coming up, we look at the flying competition you can enjoy without jumping out of a plane.